thankful for your faithfulness. We're thankful for how you lead us. And God, I pray this morning as we sing, as we worship, that you would be blessed, that your name would be lifted up, and Lord, that you'd speak to our hearts today and have your way in our lives. And we pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Let's sing this familiar song, Amazing Grace.
about this. There's nothing your God wouldn't do to be in a relationship with you. There's no mountain he wouldn't climb up. There's no shadow he wouldn't light up. He's chasing after you today. Turn your hearts toward him. Sing it out. There's no shadow. There's no shadow you won't light up. Mountain you won't climb up. Coming after me. There's no wall. There's no wall you won't kick down. Lie you won't tear down, coming after me. Sing that again, there's no shadow. There's no shadow you won't light up, mountain you won't climb up, coming after me. There's no wall. There's no wall you won't kick down, lie you won't tear down, coming after me. There's no shadow you won't light up. Mountain, you won't climb up, coming after me. Aren't you thankful? There's no wall you won't kick down, lie you won't tear down, coming after me. of praise, man. I know um, in kids' church, I think it was Wednesday night or Sunday morning, they were blowing up these little white balloons. Connie, I think you were leading in them, uh, that and them in that, and they drew these sheep faces on them, and as they were leaving, you know, Connie was so precious to be saying to each one of them, now, now remember, you know, how many sheep were there? You know, okay, you know, there were a hundred, and God came after you, right? Uh, and just that thought, right, that he cares about us so much, each and every one of us, that he would leave the 99 there to go search after us. Aren't you thankful that he did that? Can you remember that time in your life when he pursued you? I know C.S. Lewis has referred to God as being the hound of heaven, right? Like he just constantly chases after that, uh, after us, and I'm so thankful for that. Um, and this next song, I know that it's kind of become one of our church's favorites, uh, just Waymaker. And so just thinking about all those things that God is is to us. He's been light in our darkness. Um, he's turned our lives around. He's touched our hearts. Uh, so let's just continue and worship to the God who pursues us. He is our way maker. He's worthy of our praise. You are here, moving in the midst. I worship you. I worship you. Are here working in this place. I worship you. I worship you. Sing that again. You are here moving in our midst. I worship you. I worship you. You are here.
touching every heart. I worship you. I worship you. You are here, healing every heart. I worship you. I worship you. You are here, turning lives around. I worship you. I worship you. You are here, mending every heart. I worship you. I worship you. You are way maker, miracle work, promise keeper, light in the darkness, my God, that is who you are. You are way maker, miracle worker, promise keeper, light in the darkness, my God, that is who you are. Even when I don't see it, even when I don't see it, you're working. Even when I don't feel it, you're working. You never stop, you never stop working. You never stop, you never stop working. Even when I don't see it, you're working. Even when I don't feel it, you're working. You never stop, you never stop working. You never stop, you never stop working. Even when I don't see it, you're working. Even when I don't feel it, you're working. You never stop, you never stop working. You never stop, you never stop working. Waymaker, waymaker, miracle worker, promise keeper, light in the darkness. My God, that is who you are. it's so good to give that adoration to God and sometimes we just need to declare it for ourselves right and sometimes we just need to speak it over the enemy and the circumstances that we have in our lives just say no hold on <laughs> this is who my God is he is a way maker he is a miracle worker he's going to keep his promises and I'm so thankful that on Sunday's church this is such, just such a blessing to gather together corporately and to sing these things and um, we're going to be entering into this this next song goodness of God and then having a time of prayer and let's just continue in the spirit of just gratitude for the goodness of God for all that he's done for us um, you know there's a passage in Colossians and it says this devote yourselves to prayer being watchful and thankful right so prayer shouldn't just be an afterthought oh before we go to bed I need to remember to pray that's good, but we really should be devoted to prayer. And so, you know, throughout the day, you can have periods of time where you're just acknowledging God, right? It can be out loud, it can be in your mind. But one thing that's really helped me is this acronym ACTS, so A-C-T-S, and it stands for Adoration, Confession, 
thanksgiving, and supplication. So we're going to be kind of walking through that model the next four weeks. It's just a tool, right? There's really no necessarily right or wrong way to come to the Heavenly Father, and sometimes we do that in desperation, and that's good. And sometimes we do it in more of a structured, God, I want to come, and I really want to be intentional about focusing and praying. And so we're going to focus on the A today, which is adoration, which is why I've been singing these songs about, man, God, your reckless love, and your grace and your mercy, and now we're going to sing about his goodness, Um, but just lift this praise up to him, and then as we enter that time of prayer, these altars are always open for you. Um, I know sometimes it can feel intimidating. If you ever want to come and just pray and be left alone, (laughs) sometimes we want those moments, you can come to these altars on the outside here, um, and no one will come pray with you. You can just be by yourselves, have that time with God. But if you want to come forward to either of these these two uh, altars, or if you want to sit on one of these two front pews, your church body would love to come and pray with you. Sometimes you need that person beside you to pray you through. So um, please just keep that in the back of your mind. Throughout the service, (laughs) Daryl, am I going too long? Throughout the service, we just want this to be a place where the spirit has freedom, right, to work and to move. So sing about God's goodness. Your mercy never fails me All my days I've been held in your hands From the moment when I wake up Until I lay my head I will sing of the goodness of God are close like no other. I love you as a father. I've known you as a friend. I will sing in the goodness of God. All my life, all my life you have been faithful. All my so so good with every breath that I am able I will sing of the goodness of God your goodness your goodness is running after it's running after me your goodness is running after it's running after me with my life laid down I'm surrender now I give you everything your goodness is running after it's running after me your goodness is running after it's running after me your goodness is running after it's running after me with my life laid down and surrender now I give you everything your goodness is running after it's running after me all my life all my life you have been faithful So, so good With every breath that I am able I will sing of the goodness of God I will sing of the 
of the goodness of God. Amen. Amen. Have you ever had something that was really good, really delicious, like everything my wife cooks? And you got someone else there who just won't try it. It's like they don't want to try it. This happens with my son sometimes. There's something he hasn't tried before, but it's like a dessert. It's a candy. And my, my oldest, Jeremiah, will be like, nah, I don't want to try it. And you say, man, if you could just taste, if you would just try one taste, I wouldn't be able to eat the rest of this. You'd take it off my plate. It's that good. That's our God. You know, he invites us. He says, taste and see that the Lord is good. He's not worried if you try him out if you're going to be not satisfied. He knows you'll be satisfied if you would just taste, if you would just see. And this morning, that's, that's my invitation as we go to prayer. I mean, my prayer for you isn't that you hear about God, that you learn about God. I pray that you experience God yourself, that you taste and see that the Lord is good. Because once you taste, you can't but help but sing along and maybe raise a hand sometimes or just say, thank you, God. Because all my life you've been faithful. Amen. And so as we go to prayer this morning, we've got some special needs. We're going to anoint someone. You can come forward, Crystal. If you want to gather and pray with her, you can. But we're just going to go to the Lord. We're going to start off just by thanking him and then get into some specific needs. But would you pray with me this morning? Lord, we're just so thankful to be in your house. God, I thank you for every person here. Lord, I thank you that just as we sang, you've been faithful. Lord, you've been good. It doesn't mean every situation we faced has been good, but you've been good. Lord, you see us through. You walk beside us. You, you, you give us strength. You, you go before us. And so, Lord, this morning, we just want to thank you and praise you for who you are and all that you've done. God, may we never get over that. And, Lord, I know this morning in a, in a group like this this morning, in person on, and some online, maybe there's some in this place this morning that have just, they've not entered that relationship with you. God. Would you draw their hearts today? God, I pray that they would just come to you this morning. They'd say, I want to taste and see. God, that they'd experience your love and your goodness and your forgiveness and your grace and your mercy that's available for everybody in this room, everybody. No exceptions. God, that's how much you love us. That's how much you pursue us. And so, God, we start off by lifting you up and praising your name. And, Lord, we do want to go to some specific needs Especially this morning, we want to remember the family of Dan Dutro. Or we think about the Simons family. And as Dan passed just last night, God, we pray that you'd surround this family, comfort them, help them, strengthen them. God, we're so thankful that Dan knew you. He had a relationship with you. He's tasted and seen, and Lord, he's having a feast now. But Lord, I pray you'd help this family as they, Lord, they're grieving. Lord, they, they, they've lost someone they love. And God, I just pray you draw close and help them, give them strength. Lord, we pray you'd continue to touch and heal Vernita. Lord, we just pray for just a complete touch upon her. We got several others recovering at home. We think of Cindy, we think of Monty, we think of Michael. Lord, we just pray you'd go to them and others. I don't know every need, but you know them all, God. Pray you just help them, give them strength, help them to recover. Lord, we think of Josh. I pray that you would touch him in this tumor he's battling. Lord, that you just help it. Heal him, we pray. And Lord, this morning, we also want to lift up especially Crystal to you. And as we pray this morning, those of you who may not know, she's got open heart surgery coming up on the 10th of February. And so this might be her last Sunday here before she goes. And the scripture teaches us that, hey, are any among you sick? Let them come. Let them be anointed. Let, let others gather and pray. And the prayer of faith heals the sick. And so the oil, there's nothing special about the oil other than it represents the Holy Spirit and the power of God. And so this morning, Crystal, I anoint you in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. And Lord, we come and we just ask that you would touch and heal Crystal, Lord. We're thankful for these doctors. We're thankful for um, these nurses how, and they were, how they were able to find what's going on in this operation coming up. And God, we're thankful that you work through doctors. And Lord, we pray that you would bring about a complete healing on her heart through this, God. That every issue, everything that's gone, gone a little off or just needs to be fixed, Lord, it would be fixed. And that this surgery would be a complete success. And Lord, that there would be a quick recovery for her. 
And I pray, God, you'd give her peace as she's going in. And her family, give them peace, Lord. Let, reminding us, just as we talked about, that you don't just walk with us, but you go before us. There's no operating room we're going to walk in that, you, Lord, you've gone before. You prepare a way. You're a way maker. And so, Lord, we do honor you this morning. We pray for Crystal, Lord. And we just ask that in the rest of our time together this morning, you would continue to work in our lives and hearts. Make us more like you. Draw us close. We love you. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. And everybody said, amen, amen. amen. You may be seated except for the family of Jonah. And uh, so if you're a family of Jonah, or if you are Jonah yourself, come up here, please. We got a special thing this morning. We're dedicating Jonah to the Lord. That's an exciting thing. In fact, maybe nothing more exciting. If you could help me with that when it's time. Okay, thank you. Just come back here. Thank you. All right, so we'll let everybody get up here and kind of, there he is. Hey, buddy, it's your big day. <laughs> oh, big smiles. Oh, man. Oh, he's so sweet. This is one of my favorite things that I get to do in ministry is dedicating babies to the Lord. But we all know, we all know the dedication takes a moment. But to fulfill what you say and what you commit to do at the dedication, that takes, that takes a life, you know. And so in this moment, it's a special moment. But you know what? God's going to help you. I believe that. God's going to help you to raise up Jonah to know and love him and fear him. And we're full of promises in the Scripture that if we live righteously, if we train up our kids in the way that, we, that they should go, those things extend on for generations. That's, that's how God works. He can bless even generations after us. And so... Um, just a few notes about Jonah for you. Jonah was born on November 1st, November 1st, at Columbus Regional Hospital. He was 6 pounds, 7 ounces, and 19 inches long. And he's just sweet as ever, isn't he? He's such a blessing to us. And there's something beautiful about kids, and Jesus saw it. You're familiar with the passage, but Matthew 19, 13, verses 13 and 14 says this. Then people brought little children to Jesus for him to place his hands on them and pray for them. They wanted to dedicate their babies. But the disciples rebuked them. And Jesus said, Let the little children come to me and do not hinder them, for the kingdom of heaven belongs to such as these. It's a great reminder for us, isn't it? About priorities, about what's important, about what to make time for. Kids are that special. Well, Jacob and Kira, in presenting this child for dedication, you signify not only your faith in Christ, but also your desire that Jonah may come to know and love Christ at an early age and live for him throughout his life and experience eternal life with Christ. That's what it's all about. However, for this to happen, it's going to take some requirements on your part, right? <laughs> He's excited. He's excited. <laughs> You'll have to be engaged. You will. You'll have to be engaged. You'll have to be intentional. It'll be your duty as his parent to teach him early to fear and love and know the Lord to watch over his education, direct his young mind to the scriptures, get his feet in church as often as possible, help him choose good friends, keep him from bad company and habits, and more than anyone else, more than anyone else, more than your pastor, more than your church, Jake and Kara, it's, it's your duty to raise him up to know and love God. And if you will give yourself to do so by the help of God, answer, I will. All right, now family, you're a big part. Huge. Right? It's more than just them two. They need, they're going to need help. There's probably already been some days they needed some help. But more than just changing diapers. But, man, to help Jonah know God, love God, serve God, put him first. So I ask you, will you commit yourself, family, as the support and to, to support and encourage Jonah and to assist by nurturing his growth towards spiritual maturity? And if so, answer, we will. All right. Church family. It's on us too. But one thing that I want you to know is we have a responsibility to each, other ki each other's kids. I got a responsibility to yours, and I, you got one to mine. And we all have one to Jonah. I mean, we want to help encourage these kids, nurture them, love them, point them to Jesus. You know, sometimes something you say to Jonah might just stick more than Jake and Kira saying that. Anybody been a teenager before? Yeah, okay. Sometimes it's just that mom says it's not enough. But when you pray, when you talk to them, when you encourage them, it makes a difference. It's made a difference in my life. Many of us could say the same thing. 
So as a part of this body, I want you to commit, to support, encourage, and point Jonah to Jesus. To pray for him. Will you commit yourself as the body of Christ to do that? If so, answer, we will. All right, now Jonah's going to let me here. Come here, buddy. I'm going to pray over this sweetie pie. Oh, he's just precious. Let's pray. In the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, I dedicate Jonah Ray Sales. And Lord, you know his parents have come. It's their desire, Lord, to help Jonah to love you, to know you, to serve you. And God, I pray that you would bless this young child. God, I pray that he would put you first from a young age. God, I pray that his life would be a testimony of your faithfulness, of your love, of your forgiveness, of your strength, of your guidance. Lord, I pray that even at a young age, it'd be like the scripture says in Timothy, he'd, he'd be an example for us, Lord, in speech, in life, in love, in purity, in faithfulness. Lord, I pray that this young boy, even now, God, you've got a, a future mate for him, possibly, a future spouse. Lord, I pray even now for that girl. Lord, I pray that you would watch over her. Lord, that she would come to know you. Lord, I pray that in the days ahead, there's going to be some ups and downs. I pray that young Jonah, Lord, for his whole life, he would look to you. And Lord, when he goes through hard times, it would just draw him closer to you, not push him away. And Lord, I pray for Jake and Kira. God, they're going to need your help. There's going to be days where it's a struggle, days where it's a battle. And Lord, I just pray that every day, God, they would pray and lift up their young son. And God, as they get challenged or discouraged, they'd have family step in, encourage them, church family step in. And Lord, that you'd give them strength, give them wisdom. There's going to be some big decisions they've got to make. And Lord, I pray you'd help them to know the right thing to do in the right way. So help them, God. And Lord, we just pray your blessing and protection on this family. And Lord, on sweet Jonah, especially as we dedicate him to you. Lord, may you watch him. May you keep him all his days and bring him home safely to you. We pray it in Jesus' strong name. And everyone said, amen. amen, amen. Well, you know, can I show them off real quick? All right, let's see. I love babies. Here he is. There's Jonah. Say hey. Hey, everybody. He's checking it out. He's checking everybody out. Man, he's, he's ready to preach almost, I think. All right, I'll give him back now. So we got a few things for you this morning. Liz, if you could help me out. Thank you. So the first is, uh, this is just a certificate. You know, you, that'll be a reminder for you, the, the day that you dedicate him to the Lord. There may be a day you need to pull that out and say, man, we gave him to the Lord. He's going to help us. He's going to keep us. And this, this Bible here is kind of a keepsake, you know, just a reminder of the day you dedicated him and, and, a, and a little, you know, you might keep that one nice. But, but this one here, this is one that probably by the time he's older, I hope, man, the pages are ripped out of this and the cover's broken. Because my, my hope for you guys is that you have a family time of prayer and devotions. And here's just a little start one. Um, it just kind of does a verse a day and, you know, it gives you a little thought about the scripture and you pray and it's made for kids. And, you know, just instituting that, starting that maybe at nights or in the mornings with him. And you guys do it as a family. And maybe when they're young, it's only a minute. It will make a huge difference as you pray and spend time in the Word together. So there you go. That's from the church. And can we just give them a hand as they go sit down? And so thankful for you guys. You guys can be seated. Should we have one more? I don't know. I love babies. No, she said, let up. <laughs> I just love babies, man. But no, we're good. We're good. We're good. Hey, if you've got your Bibles, go ahead and open to Romans chapter 1 today. All right. I'll probably be in trouble for that one. That's all right. I, I get in trouble a lot. Well, hey, um, today we're going to continue our study or looking at renewing, like the renewing God wants to do in us. And in your life and my life, because we, we talked about this last week, when you become a Christian, when you give your life to Christ, a lot of things happen in a moment, right? You're born again. You're, you're a new creation in Christ Jesus. You're a citizen of heaven. But the thing is, 
while those things do happen in a moment, there's some things that we have to continue to mature and grow in, right? And we talked about last week how that's got to happen in the mind. Like, i got to be transformed in the way that I think. God wants to change the way I live, but he can't change the way I live unless I allow God to change the way I think. You know, I can't think the same way I did before, Christ, before I knew Christ and think I'm going to be differently just because I went and prayed a prayer. I mean, God's got to transform my mind, and I'm not making that up. That's what it says in Romans chapter 12, verse 2. It says, be transformed by what? The renewing of your mind. And that's a continual thing. And so today, we're going to talk specifically about an area of, re- of our minds that needs renewed. And it's really, it's about our mindset and our attitude. You, could, you know, I didn't know which word was better. I thought I'll use both. Your mindset, your attitude, the way you approach life. See, last week we talked about what we think and how we think, but today, I mean, how do you approach life? What is your mindset? And let me tell you, I think it's overlooked sometimes just how important your attitude and your mindset really is. You know, I first learned the importance of attitude and mindset, like having the right attitude, the right mindset. I really first learned about it when I was in wrestling. So, uh, as a, in high school, I was a wrestler. A lot of people look at me now and say, no way. And I say it too, but I did, okay? In fact, I almost for proof thought I'd show a picture of me in my singlet, but I thought, one, that'll get me in more trouble with my wife, and two, you just can't unsee that. I don't know if you've ever seen like a wrestling outfit, so I'm like, you know what, I'll spare you guys um, that. But I, just to prove, I did, but I, wasn't, I really wasn't the greatest. You know, a lot of these kids wrestled from a young age coming up, and I didn't start till I was a freshman, in my freshman year, I was like, I had a 500 record, but I was the lowest weight class, so you got a lot of forfeit wins. But I counted them, whatever. You know, I still won. But I learned going into my sophomore year, our coaches would drill this home, that if you can go into a match with the right mindset, you will beat people who are better than you. Will you beat everyone? No, you won't beat everyone. But like we would, he would have us before, before we went to a tournament, before we got in a match. I mean, our coach would say, I want you to visualize yourself winning this thing. I want you to picture yourself getting that medal at the end of this tournament or that trophy. I want you to picture yourself, and he, I mean, he would get serious. He'd say, I want you to break this other person. He didn't mean hurt him physically. He meant mindset. Amen. I want you to get on the mat, and even if he's better than you, I want you to be so relentless and just go hard, go hard, run back to the center, be the first one, be ready, make them tired just thinking about having to wrestle you. And then you, you can win a match against someone who's better than you just because you got the right mindset. You're not more talented, but you've got the right attitude. You're persistent. And you know, as, as I've gotten older and thought about it, man, there's so many areas that, of life that applies to. When I was uh, going through some training and stuff to do premarital counseling that I take couples through, one of the things that was interesting to me is one of the greatest indicators for whether or not a marriage will be successful, there's a couple, I'm not saying this is the only one, but one of the huge ones is how do these people handle like when trials come? Do they just crumple? Does it, does it, I, can they not handle when circumstances get bad? That's one of the greatest indicators for whether or not a marriage will be successful. It's not do they love each other, do they care about each other, but it's what's their attitude and approach when things get hard. It can be one of the greatest things. And it's not just that, but there's so many things. But, but we need more than just this you know, wrestling attitude or, hey, I got to stay positive when trials come. As Christians, there's a couple areas of attitude that, that we really need to have. It's a mindset, a way that we see the world, a way that we live. And as Christians, we're going to talk about two today. We need to have an attitude or a mindset that is thankful and that is hopeful. Thankful and hopeful. Does that mean you will always feel thankful or hopeful? No, it doesn't. I mean, there'll be times that come that, you, man, you just get off track. But what it means is you've got a home base for your life. It's where you normally operate out of. Are you normally thankful and hopeful or are you normally not? I mean, everybody maybe has something come and you kind of stray out of that. But do you go back to being thankful and hopeful or do you kind of get sidetracked and get off track? And so that's what we're going to talk about today. But we're going to look at Romans chapter 1. And if you're familiar with Romans chapter 1, 
especially the second half of it. Romans chapter 1, verses 18 through the end of the chapter is kind of a, actually, it's, it's kind of a depressing passage if you read it. Uh, and I'd encourage you to later because what it talks about is basically the downward spiral that a culture can go through or a people can go through and getting farther away from God and more and more wicked. And in fact, like when you read near the end of it, I'll put it up there, verses 29 through 31. This is describing this culture that's kind of taken place in Romans 1, 29, verses through 31. It says, they've become filled with every kind of wickedness, evil, greed, and depravity. They're full of envy, murder, strife, deceit, and malice. They're gossips, slanderers, God-haters, insolent, arrogant, and boastful. They invent new ways of doing evil. They disobey their parents. They have no understanding, no fidelity, no love, no mercy. And that's a little depressing, right? I mean, it's this description of just this culture, this society, whatever, that's just kind of spiraled away from God, away from God, away from God. But what I want you and you and me to look at today is this. How did they get there? How did they get there? See, sometimes we learn We can learn from saying, hey, here's what to do. Do this. But I think sometimes we can learn by saying, hey, here's what not to do. Here's what, don't do this. This is what leads to that. And there's two verses in Romans 1 that really lay out for us how they got here. How did they get to this point? The first one is Romans 1.21. It says, for although they knew God... So they knew God. They knew about God. Maybe they had had a relationship or worshipped him or whatever... They knew God. They neither glorified him as God nor gave thanks to him. But their thinking became futile or foolish, and their foolish hearts were darkened. Verse 25. This is another part of it. They exchanged the truth about God for a lie and worshiped and served created things rather than the creator who is forever praised. Amen. And what happens here? Notice, there's two things that happened that led to them falling away and just going down this downward spiral. And now who would thought this was the first thing? But it all started when they stopped glorifying God for who he is. They didn't recognize him as God, and they stopped thanking him for all he'd done. They quit glorifying or praising God And they stopped thanking him. And then in verse 25 it says, so they started doing it to something else. They worshiped created things. They thanked created things rather than the creator. Okay? And they got it backwards. You know, it could have been an idol or others or even themselves. But they got something else that they decided this is the thing worthy of praise and worship. And they stopped giving thanks to God. And if you want to go the wrong way, you want to get away from God as fast as you can... That's, I, I believe that's the way to do it. Stop thanking God. Stop praising the Lord. Stop honoring him. You know, as we sang Waymaker this morning, we're saying you're a Waymaker, miracle worker, you're a promise keeper. We were singing about his faithfulness. Don't do that. Stop thanking the Lord. Stop praising the Lord. And it'll drive you from him faster than you think. That's where this whole downward spiral started for these people. It wasn't that they went out and did something terrible. They just cut off God. They made it all about themselves. But the opposite of this is true also. You want to get far from God fast? Quit thanking him. You want to enter his house? You want to enter his gates? You want to enter his presence? You enter him, Psalm 100, verse 4. You enter him with thanksgiving in his courts with praise. Give thanks to him. Bless his name. If the fastest way out of God's presence is to not give him praise and not thank him and not glorify him, the fastest way in is what? To praise his name And give him thanks. We praise him and we thank him. That's not just, we don't just sing songs on Sunday morning because it's a nice way to wake you guys up. I mean, God's worthy of praise. He's worthy of our thanks. And you know, when you stop and think about it, really, this, this is what it's saying here. He's saying they didn't glorify him as God or give thanks. And he says here on the other side, he says, you want to enter his house, enter with thanksgiving and praise. And there's kind of two aspects of this. The first thing is we praise the Lord for who he is. We praise him for who he is. Man, this needs to be a part of your life, not like every Sunday, but like man, every day. Get this in there somewhere. Thanking God, praising him, glorifying him for who he is. 
Who is he? I mean, he's a creator. He made us. He sustains us. He's a, our provider. He's a healer. He's the God who sees us. He's the God who hears us. He's the almighty. He's the good shepherd. He's our savior. I mean, th- this is who he is. That's, we're not even got to what he does yet. We're just talking about who he is. He is love. He's not just loving. He is love itself. He's kind. He's forgiving. He's just. He's faithful. And for that, we say, you're worthy of glory. You are worthy of it. I mean, so I, I can't believe sometimes I can get in this mindset where I'm not thankful, I'm not grateful when this is who my God is. So you, that's the first thing. We just praise him for who he is. Regardless of your circumstances in your life, God's worthy of praise for what we just talked about. And more. That's not a comprehensive list. I mean, you could go through the Psalms. You could go Psalm by Psalm. And I do this sometimes. I mean, this, this might be a good study for you. You say, I don't know where to read right now. Why don't you just start reading through Psalms and underline every word that tells you who God is or what he's like. And you will be overwhelmed. And you'll find out what, when you need provision, God says he's a provider. He says he's a healer. He says he's faithful. I mean, all these things. And you'll just, I mean, that's a great study. It's a great way to get to know God better. So we praise him for who he is regardless of our circumstances. But on the second, the other side of that, we thank him for what he's done. We thank him for all that he's done. And so, I mean, a simple way to do this is saying, okay, all these things he is, now when has that shown up in your life? If God is forgiving, I mean, man, do you remember when God forgave you? Thank him. If God's a provider, I mean, how many of us woke up and we had enough to have breakfast this morning? You know, we were able to come to a church that's heated. We're able to gather. I mean, you thank him. And you, I mean, all throughout our lives, there's tons of things that we could just stop and thank God for. And sometimes we don't. You know, uh, I forget who it was that asked me this question, and I don't know that it was, they came up with it, but they asked this question, what if you woke up tomorrow and you only had the things you thanked God for last week? What if you woke up tomorrow and the only things you had in your life were things you thanked God for over the last seven days? I mean, how many things do we take for granted? I mean, that was kind of a wake-up call for me. Like, you know, man, I I take things for granted that that I'm just going to have all these things. But, man, they're blessings from God. And I don't want to withhold the praise and the thanksgiving that God is due. You know, when you get into Revelation, in a lot of Revelation, you get a picture of what heaven's going to be like. You want to know a word that happens a lot in Revelation? Worthy. God is worthy of all praise and glory and honor. I mean, he's worthy of all of it. And sometimes I don't live like it. Sometimes I don't speak it enough. So we thank him, we praise him. But in light of all this, there's a question. Okay, you know, and and for for a lot of you, man, we've been in church a long time. You say, man, this is just review. I know God's worthy. Okay, so but then here's the question. Then why aren't we always thankful? That's the key. If you know it, why sometimes in my life, Am I not thankful? Why do I get sucked in and, and I'm not praising God? And actually, I'm a little bit ungrateful. Well, there's, I think there's three simple ways that you can live ungrateful in spite of all God's blessings. You want to be ungrateful? Here's three simple ways. First, keep telling yourself you deserve better. You want to be ungrateful? Get in this attitude where you just say, man, I, I deserve better than this. That person who got that job should have been mine. That should have been mine. I deserved it. I deserve better. If someone else gets, you know, the spot on the team, if, if someone, I mean, whatever it is, everything, you deserved better. And so then the things that you have, you're not thankful for because it's not enough. You should be making more. Don't you know that? I mean, you deserve a nicer house, a nicer car. You deserve a better relationship. You should have it. Don't let anyone tell you otherwise. I mean, I can't believe you don't have, I can't believe you've been overlooked all this time. That's what I call the entitlement mindset, Right? I deserve better than I have. And if you tell yourself that story all day long, I promise you won't come to church praising the Lord. I mean, you'll just be wrapped up. Man, why don't I have those things? And see, that kind of flows into the next one. If you want to be ungrateful, it's really simple. Just focus on your problems. I mean, how many of you guys have heard that song, count your blessings, count them one by one? Please, someone say you've heard that before, okay? All right, okay. Like, if I'm doing this, somebody better raise their hand. Okay, but that, that's a great way to be thankful, count your blessings. 
In fact, the scripture tells us that. Psalm 103, 2, it says, Praise the Lord, my soul, and forget not all his benefits. That's what this passage says, Psalm 103. It says, hey, praise the Lord, and I'm not going to forget all his benefits. And then he goes and he lists all the things that God does. You want to get thankful, go read through Psalm 103 and, and just say it to the Lord from your heart. But you want to be unthankful, ungrateful? Go through and count your problems. Man, just count everything. Why don't you just look back over the last week and just think of everything that went wrong. Car didn't start. You know, it was cold out. It snowed. And then, you know, it was like I, I forgot to ice my, or I forgot to go out and scrape my car. And so I was late to work. This happened. It wasn't fair. You know, I had this unexpected expense. I mean, if you just go through count your problems, again, I promise you won't show up to church on Sunday praising the Lord. Because you're, you got the wrong focus. And now here's the thing. You can have two people, exact same circumstances in life, exact same amount of blessings, exact same amount of problems, and one can be thankful and one can be unthankful. You can go to places where they have nothing. Okay, I can remember going on a mission trip. We went to Brazil. I was like 13-ish. And we went to Brazil, and we were helping build a church with these people. And they, 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 you know, a lot of times you'll get people who are contracted in to help. These were people who were going there. They were young people. They just wanted to have this church. And they were so thankful we came that they wanted to show some appreciation when we left. And there was one younger guy there I'd bonded with when I was there. And just, you know, he, we just had a, you know, kind of good relationship. We couldn't talk that much, but we would just, you know, whatever. And he had nothing to give me. He took the shirt off his back and gave it to me, literally. Just say thanks. And you can come home, and you can, we can be unthankful because, you know, my toaster's broken. And I wanted waffles. Whatever, you know. I mean, we can just be unthankful. We can focus on our problems. We've got everything. But I'm telling you, you count the wrong thing, you get the wrong focus, you'll be unthankful. You will. Here's a third way. Compare yourself to others. Man, comparison kills gratitude like that. I mean, it just does. It has a way of just making us all of a sudden, like we just don't feel good about ourselves. We feel like someone else has got it better. I mean, this happens all the time. This is really common. In fact, this might be the number one reason in our world why so many people are unthankful and why it happens to me too. It can happen to us. Is I mean, you're happy you, you just got a new car, but then you see your friend's nicer new car. And yours doesn't look as cool anymore. You loved your vacation. You're posting about, man, we went to Florida. It was awesome. And, and then your friend's like, wow, that's great. We just got back from Hawaii. And you're just like, oh, man, dude, Florida stinks, you know. I mean, you get backwards. You get this comparison. And all of a sudden, what looked great five minutes ago doesn't look good anymore. And you're focused on, man, why does this person have more than me? You know, it happened this week. It was funny. The carpet looks pretty nice in the foyer, right? It's a pretty nice carpet, right? It's pretty clean. No, wrong. It looks terrible. You know how I know? We cleaned the office carpet this week. And, like, I thought the foyer carpet was totally clean and fine. It looked great. It had already been cleaned more recently, so we cleaned the office carpet. And then you open the door to the office, and you just see this line. And it's like, clean carpet, dirty carpet. Now we're like, man, we got to redo the other carpet. Man, people live their life that way. Man, I, I think maybe one of the reasons so many people are ungrateful and, and just, I mean, really depressed and down is because we spend our times looking at other people's lives. And, and we're just looking at their best snapshots. But we, we find ourselves playing this comparison game of like, man, why did they have better than me? Why do they have more money? Why did they get this opportunity and I didn't? What, why do they get to travel? I never get to travel. You know, I, I mean, we, we can go through this in our lives. And I'm telling you, if you do these things, they'll lead you to being ungrateful. But it's worse than that because they're bad, not just because you're unthankful. But there's no possible way for us as Christians that ungratefulness, ingratitude, whatever, that it doesn't eventually reflect back on God. It always does. If you're not thankful, I mean, you could be unthankful about a circumstance and move on, but if you live your life in this kind of mindset of I'm not thankful, there's no way that doesn't reflect back on the God you say you love and serve and who's watching over your life because eventually it's not just, man, I deserve better. It's God, why, why don't I have better? Don't you know? I mean, God, aren't you in control? God, why does this person have more than me? 
God, why did this person get this opportunity? Why don't I have the resources, the abilities, the talents this person has? And our un- when we're ungrateful about ourselves and others, eventually it reflects back on the God who we're serving. We've got to be very careful about ingratitude. It's, real, it's dangerous. It impacts our relationship with God more than we think. Because instead of thanking God, what do we do? We complain. We walk away from praise. But here's a final reason I think a lot of people aren't thankful. And I, really, I think this one's very, very relevant to where we are today. A lot of people aren't thankful in the present Not because things are so bad, not because they're playing this comparison game, but it's because they've lost all hope for the future. When you're not hopeful about the future, it's hard to be thankful about the present. You ever met someone like that who it's like, I mean, you just say, hey, man, look at, man, you did great. Well, it doesn't matter. I'm going to blow it next time, right? Man, you had a great game. It doesn't matter. I'll turn it over next game. It was just a fluke, you know? I mean, you ever met somebody like that? I mean, it's just like, but you know, we can do that, and we can do that on a big scale. We cannot be thankful for the freedom we have to come and worship, the freedom we have to have our families over, the, the ability and the blessings we have. You know, I mean, we've got enough that we can feed ourselves, we can eat, we can bless others. And we, we're not thankful because we're worried about, well, yeah, but what if this happens in the future and it gets worse? Instead of just being thankful for what we've got right now. And see, this is where the second thing comes in. If we're Christian, we've got to be thankful, but we've got to be hopeful. An attitude of hope is is pretty much simply this. It's trusting the Lord for all that's to come. It's believing his promises. It's it's trusting that he's going to come through. And I know it's tied in very closely with faith because faith is being assured of what? What we hope for. But we got to go through life and we got to have hope. Think about those promises. God's got a plan for you, right? God works all things together for good. Those verses are there to lift up hope in us. Now, I don't see how it's going to get better, but, man, that's supposed to lift up some hope inside of us because the Scripture says we don't just have, like, a little hope sometimes. It says we're supposed to have a living hope. That's what it says in 1 Peter. We've got a living hope because our hope's tied to Jesus Christ, and they killed him, and he came right back. Our hope's alive. I mean, it's, it's all, I mean we, we, no matter what we face, we can't lose hope. We've got to live with that attitude of hope. And really, if you've seen it, There's few things sadder than either personally going through or watching somebody go through life with no hope. Why is that sad? Why is that hard? Because hope impacts everything you do. There's not a single thing you do that hope does not impact, or at least not a single thing important. Think about it. How many of you are going to apply for a job you've got no hope of getting? I mean, I, got, I don't know anything about being a doctor. I don't, I, you know, I don't like shots. I, I, I like faint when there's blood. What if I just went and I'm like, I'm going to apply at Columbus Regional. Here they got a doctor opening. Why waste my time? I'm not going to get it. There's no hope. See, when you have no hope, you just cut whole sections off of your life. You know, And some of it, I mean, like the doctor thing, that makes sense, right? I should just cut up that I'm, I'm not going to be a doctor. There's no hope. I didn't go to school. But, you know, we can cut off whole sections of our life of things that are possible, if, God, if we trusted God and we, we obeyed. We've got to have hope. You've got to live with hope. I mean, because here's something. Will you pray for someone if deep down you have no hope that they're ever going to come to know Jesus? Here's the thing. We might say we pray, but you're really going to keep praying for someone that you've given up hope on? You're going to invite someone to church, you have no hope that they'll ever come. No, because when you lose hope, here's what happens. You just cut that possibility off. It's never going to happen. And now here's the thing. I think sometimes we live, we live with less hope than maybe we think we do. You know, it's like, I mean, how many people in my life, I have to be honest, you know, as I was preparing this, I look back over my life and especially, you know, my years when I came to Christ and I was, you know, I was living or I was working at a place and, and I was, you know, where I went to work, I would tell some people about Jesus, but there were others I just, man, I just never talked to. Why? I had no hope that they were coming to Jesus. That was, that was probably wrong of me. And, and you, you think about it, I mean, it's real easy to go through life with a whole lot of people. We've just said, I don't have any hope for that. So we stop praying. So we stop inviting. So we stop, you know, just, you know, just calling upon God to do something because we've given up hope. But as Christians, I mean, we've got to live with an attitude of hope. I mean, how many situations can we just give up on? There's things in our life, they're not the way God wants them to be, but we've given up hope that God can do something about it. 
or God will do something about it. We would never say that, but man, that's where our life is. We, we've lost hope. But here's the, here's the turn. Think about this. We've got to learn to live with hope in all circumstances. All circumstances. We've got to learn to live with hope, and God will help us and renew us. And one person who learned that was King David in the Old Testament. I want to just show you a couple of Psalms that King David wrote, and they're just brimming with hope. That's why I'd say they're just overflowing with hope. Look at Psalm 27, verse 13. He says this, I remain confident. I'm confident of this. What? I will see, I will see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. Does that sound like somebody who's given up hope? He says, I remain confident. I don't see it now. You know, you don't have to write this verse when everything's good. Psalm 27 talks about, hey, man, even if this torrent, even if these armies come at me, even if these things overwhelm me. I mean, this is how he's ending this psalm. He says, I remain confident of this. I don't see it right now, but I'm going to see the goodness of God. I'm going to see it. I believe it. In the land of the living. And now we know heaven's the land of the living. That's not the land of the dead. But what he was getting at right here. Now I'm going to see it while I walk this earth. God's going to be good. Doesn't mean everything's going to work out, but he's going to be good. Second one is this. You're familiar with this one. Psalm 23, 6. Surely your goodness and love will follow me. How many days of my life? All of them. All the days of my life, they're going to follow me. And I'm going to dwell in the house of the Lord forever. There might not be a better picture of Christian hope than that right there. Because it says, all my life, you're going to be faithful. You're going to be good. You're going to see me through. And when this life ends, my hope doesn't die. It's realized. I mean, I see it. I mean, it happens. It comes. And, And what kind of attitude is this? See, David's got an attitude like this. I'm expecting God to come through in my life. I'm expecting God to bring a breakthrough. I I'm, I'm remain confident that this thing, I can't figure it out right now, but God's going to do something. And see, when we lose that mindset as Christians, man, doesn't it impact your prayer life? Doesn't it impact your attitude and just how you generally feel about the day when you've lost hope? But when you get this hope that's brimming, I mean, that's when you got the faith to go out and face Goliath. I don't know how, but God's going to come through. My God's going to see me. Surely he's going to come through. I'm confident he's going to come through. Those are the type of words that, that, I mean, we just need to be reminded of and just say, wait a second. Why am I believing a lie? Why why have I given up hope? Why have I just let this thing, you know, consume me to where I just down every day? Like, I'm not expecting God to come through. Because if we're honest, we've all had times like that. Where our expectation isn't God's going to come through. It's that this is just going to get worse. You know what, it's okay to visit there once in a while. It's not good. I mean, but sometimes we visit there when something bad happens. You get that call you never wanted, right? I mean, I mean, you, you lost your job, whatever. But you got to get back to that place of, wait a second, no, God's going to come through. See, that's where I live. That's where we got to live. God's going to come through. And so you put these things together, it's like, man, I'm thankful for all God's done, all he's doing, and I'm hopeful for every day ahead that he's going to continue to do it. They come together. And so today... As we close, I'm going to ask the band to come back up. We're just going to, we're going to sing that chorus again in just a moment. Because the thing is, thanking God, it's not just good to learn about thanking God or saying I need to be helpful, but it's even better to say, Lord, thank you. <laughs> right? I don't want to just learn it, but I want to do it. I want to say, God, thank you. God, I need hope. God, I need you to renew this in me. And confession, you know, that, that's a big part of it. Just coming and saying, God, I've lost hope. God, I haven't thanked you enough. You know, that's the starting point for a lot of us. Yeah, I had to do that. I had to do that myself just this last couple weeks. Um, You know, I got to just be honest. I got here, and man, it was a great first Sunday. Everything was awesome. It was, I'm so excited. And then three days in, I get COVID, okay? And then I give it to the whole daycare staff. I don't know if I did, but they all got it. So we have to shut down church. We have to shut down the daycare. And then the printer broke, Okay? And I got to just tell you, my initial response wasn't, thank you. You know, I mean, I'll just be honest. My initial response is, what is going on? (laughs) Right? Because I think sometimes we think, man, if I follow God, it's just, man, things should work out. 
But let me tell you, man, God, me and God, we had to have a conversation. And I didn't stay there long at all. I, mean, I, I felt it. You'd feel it, right? New job, you're starting things out, you want to start well, and it's like, boom. But I had to turn things around because my circumstances didn't change the fact that God's good. And, and in the whole scheme of things, is it really a big deal? We had to go online for a week, and, you know, I mean, I, I hated that we had to shut down the daycare because we couldn't staff it for a little bit. But you know what? God is going to see us through. I can't just, you know, throw a pity party. I can't get focused on why is this happening to me. Instead, man, I need to turn it back around and say, I believe and I remain confident of this. I'm going to see the goodness of God. And so this morning, that's what we're going to do. I don't know where you are today. Maybe today you're brimming with thankfulness. Things are great in your life. Maybe today you're not, though. You know? Like maybe today for you, you're saying, man, it's been hard. I, I've lost some hope in some circumstances. I mean, it's been a struggle. Well, what I'm going to ask us to do is if you're able, I'm going to ask you to stand. I'm going to ask you to stand. And if, if you're not able, that's fine. You can, you can do this sitting down. But I want to encourage you. I mean, if you're saying this morning, I want to renew my thanksgiving to the Lord, or man, I need to have a renewed hope, I just encourage you, as we sing, would you just lift a hand to the Lord? You may just do that and say, I'm just doing it because I want to thank God. Maybe someone's saying, I just, man, Lord, I need renewing. God, renew my mind. But we're just going to sing this chorus a couple times. And as we do, just make it about the Lord. Let's thank him. Let's give him praise. So God, we give you these next couple moments as we sing this chorus a couple times, Lord. Would you just get all the praise and glory? And would you renew our minds? Give us a mindset of thankfulness and of hope knowing, God, you've been faithful and you're gonna see us through. Let's sing together. I love you, Lord. Oh, your mercy never fails me. All my days I've been held in your hands. From the moment when I wake the goodness of God. All my life you have been faithful. And all my life you have been so, so the goodness of God. Your goodness is running after me. Your goodness is running after, it's running after me. Your goodness is running after, it's running after me. With my life laid down, I surrender now. Your goodness is running after, it's running after me. Your goodness is running after, it's running after me. Your goodness is running after, it's running after me. With my life laid down, I surrender now, I give you everything. Your goodness is running after, it's running after me. All my life, all my life you have been faithful. In all my life you have been so, so the goodness of God. Sing that again. All my life. In all my life you have been faithful. Thank you, Jesus. In all my life you have been so, so good. With every breath that I am able, I will 
of the goodness of God. I will sing of the goodness of God. Amen. Aren't you thankful for the Lord this morning? Let's pray. God, we thank you. God, and we ask, we ask you to forgive us for the times we get in a rut. And we do some of the things we talked about. We get focused on things that you made instead of you. Lord, we get caught up in thinking we deserve better. How did this person get more than me? Whatever. God, would you renew our minds? Lord, help us every day to live with an attitude of just thanksgiving and praise to you, Lord, and of hope, knowing we're confident you're going to see us through. God, I pray those truths would just rise up within us. And Lord, that when we go to our homes and our workplaces and wherever we find ourselves this week, God, that hope would just, just come out of us. Lord, it, it, the people around us, they'd say, man, there's, there's hope in you. God, that maybe that would draw people to you. Lord, and we pray for the people around us, so many, and they feel hopeless. Every statistic you look at, seems like there's more and more people who've lost hope. But God, would a hope renewal start in us? God, would it just flow out everywhere we go? God, we need you. We thank you. We praise you. We honor you. You're worthy of all praise. Be with us as we go. We pray it all in the name of Jesus. And everybody said, amen. Amen. We've got some praying here, so I'm going to ask as you go, just maybe head out to the fellowship hall quietly. Um, but thanks for being here. God bless you. Have a great day.